So I am very excited to be here today. I remember as a grad student attending this seminar, so I was in some of your shoes. And I actually wanted to call out that there's another fellow. Some of us fellows come down the hill, so there are other fellows in the audience besides me. I'm supposed to tell you that I'm the Lenore Annenberg and Wallace Annenberg Fellow at the CASPIS Center, I was told. Um, but when I'm not doing that, I'm at NYU, as Michael said, running this crazy place called the Game Innovation Lab. And I was thinking about the work that was going on here at Stanford and what might be interesting and accessible to students here given the current directions. And I thought what I could do is tell you a little bit about some things that we're thinking about in my group about designing social wearables and how play is related to the design of social wearables in an interesting manner. So that's the journey we're going to go on today. So how many people here have a wearable device? OK, how many people wear one almost every day? So a fair number of people. I actually wear this thing every day, but I realized today that the battery is running low, which is something that I'll get into in my talk a little bit. So it's not actually tracking my steps right now. But in any case, I mean, wearables are a growing and exciting segment of uh, consumer uh, electronics. And they're also a really interesting research space for people um, in our field. And they're clearly of value. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, they're a very challenging design space on a lot of different levels. So, so one obvious level is thinking about the tiny screen and how do you design interesting information display when something is small and there's not much you can put on the screen. There's also figuring out how and when to interrupt people when they're engaging with the wearable and they're engaging with their everyday life. Um, and there's figuring out where on the body you would put something uh, in a way that's going to be graceful in, in someone's everyday existence. So those are kind of some basic concerns layered onto that are issues that arise because something is sitting there on someone's body for a long length of time. So did anybody actually have this Fitbit that gave people rashes and got a rash? Nobody, nobody in this audience, I suppose. But none, oh, somebody in the back. So somebody in this room actually had this issue, OK? This is, this is crazy, but these are the kinds of things you have to start to think about when you're designing a wearable device that's meant to be on someone for a long period of time is, oh, is any component of this thing actually going to give someone a rash? And then practical concerns like, is the battery going to wear out? Um, and then I've been working more and more with people in fashion. And one of the things they talk about with wearables is washability, things getting thrown into the washing machine, and whether they can survive or not this kind of process. So there are these sort of second order concerns that have to do with intimacy to the body and the length of time something's on you. Um, those are all tough things to deal with. But the kind of challenge that I'm going to spend some time talking about today is the challenge of how these devices intersect our world socially. Um, so I think this is a challenge that can be underestimated. And in some sense, because it's so hard to design for these other issues, just figuring out how to get the form factor right, figuring out how to interface the thing with other devices, figuring out what you're going to display. But it's the kind of thing that can have a tremendous negative impact on a product. So a classic example is, is Google Glass. And I want to walk you through that example to give you a sense of, of exactly what I mean. So, so recently, Google decided to discontinue the Explorers program around Glass. I mean, they're, they're still giving out Glass to people in specific work contexts, but they're getting rid of this program, sort of putting people out into the world um, using, using the Glass device. And um, initially, when people saw uh, individuals running around with glass, they were sort of like, oh, wow, that's an exciting new technology. That's really interesting. You know, it's great that you have that thing. But shortly thereafter, as more and more people started to have this device on their face, there started to be these interesting rumblings and resistance points in the sort of social fabric around this device. So I'll give you some examples from the New York Post from last July. Um, and I'm going to read you a little, a little clip from this article. In April, a techie war erupted when East Village Restaurant Feast kicked out glass user Katie Kazmai after she refused to remove her device. Kazmai vented online, and hundreds of glass groupies rallied against Feast on Google, accusing the eatery of discriminating against people who are into new technology. Feast co-owner Brian Gaw is unapologetic. He says, Feast no glass policy is for guests' peace of mind. They just felt uncomfortable about having somebody who could potentially videotape them, explains Gaw. If someone were sitting at a table with their smartphone constantly pointing in a, in a single direction, and you didn't know what they were doing with it, you'd feel pretty uncomfortable as well. So, so basically, 
um, people started to be creeped out by the possibility that somebody was recording them when they were just sitting and wearing this device on their head. Now, obviously, Google is an incredibly smart company and spent a lot of time thinking about the social context of use of glass and how it would play out. And I actually I saw a lovely talk that was given by Hayes Raffle and Bob Riskamp at Google I.O. in 2014, in which they actually explained that their aim was to foreground the world as the experience. And what Raffle says he personally cares about most is actually creating a sense of empathy between people. So he, he wasn't about alienation at all. And the, the kinds of scenarios that are described in this talk that they gave are examples like this one, which is you know somebody in a family group is wearing glass so that um, uh, a cousin or a niece can attend a birthday party for the grandma that they couldn't otherwise be there for. So most of the examples in the talks they were giving and sort of teaching developers about the device were examples in which there were familiar people interacting with one another and using glass as a way to augment what was going on between them. Um, so the use cases were these very personal and sort of intimate experiences between people. And that's the kind of stuff that they were prototyping. Um, so, so what actually happened? What went wrong? <laughs> this, is, this is a funny meme on the internet. I, I apologize uh, for broadcasting profanity, but I think it sort of points to the fear. The furor seems to be about this anxiety about being recorded. You know? and, and it's interesting, because if you go to the, the press kit about glass, they, they carefully explain that you know, the default recording is only 10 seconds, and you completely kill the battery on the device if you record it for more than 45 minutes. But this is what makes people uncomfortable. And I think a thing about glass is something that is, is classic CSCW, and I think John Tong's in the room, but this notion of reciprocity of gaze and this idea that you know, I'm, I can't tell if you're gazing at me. There's something about this that is really uh, too, uh, too subtle for people to pick up. Um, but at a deeper level, what happened at a social level with glass um, by introducing it through this Explorers program is that people didn't just use it in their family context to interact with each other and use it in the ways that had been storyboarded and prototyped internally about how glass might be used. What they did was they did something similar to what Sergey did when he showed up on the New York subway and was kind of using it in context and was like, whoa, oh my gosh, and like took snapshots of him interacting with it. They went out and started interacting in public as much as possible to kind of show off that they had this cool new technology. So there was an inherent um, display of power and status that was going on. And that, coupled with a lack of familiarity on the part of, of people who were seeing the device, led them to come to this conclusion, oh, this thing is kind of creepy and formidable, and I don't know what this person is doing, and it's sort of disturbing. It created this, this power differential and this lack of transparency. Um, yes? mainly about the camera and the idea that somebody might be watching it, or is it just the disconnect between somebody's gaze and attention? It just seemed to me anyone who had sat down for any extended period of, let's say, that starter yeah. over the last 15 years you have a sense of having a conversation and you don't know if that person is attending you or yeah. looking up something yeah, yeah. about you. Um, and, and, and it's really disconcerting, so it was really weird to me that this big company could throw all this money into this and not kind yes. of pay attention to that experience already. Yeah. And if it's the camera thing, you think they could just go, oh, you have this little clip on camera that you pull out of your pocket and then you want yes. to film and, when you want and to it do makes it. it really like an act like pulling out a camera versus uh, like yep. any kind you're looking around you might decide to turn it on. Well, and to speak to that, like something that I've recently seen in images is people doing this with glass and basically wearing it on their head so that they're signaling really clearly when they put them on, now I'm using it, now I'm in it. Which is, which is if you think about it, a funny secondary affordance of glasses. I mean, the funny thing about glasses, it's, 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 it's appropriating glasses. So it's something that's easy to wear on the face all day that you would just leave on your face all day. But you know, we have sunglasses and we have reading glasses, right? It, as opposed to regular glasses. And those have these specialized functions that we would put down, just as you're saying. And so, I mean, to answer your question, I think it was both qualities that were, were problematic. And um, actually, that's a nice segue into this next slide. This is some really, really great work done um, in England by um, Stuart Reeves and, St and Steve Benford. I don't know if people are familiar with the work they've been doing. But they've spent a lot of time thinking about spectacle. So thinking about not just. I'm interacting with something, or even you and I are interacting with something, but 
what is it like for the people who, watch, who are watching the interaction with that something? And I think one of the biggest problems with Google Glass as a, as a, as a wearable is it's existing in this social context and people are trying to interpret and understand the moves that you're making when you put on Glass, when you engage with Glass. But if you look at this taxonomy they have, um, you can't really tell other than by, from these secondary cues of attention what somebody's doing and when very well when they're engaging with Glass. So you can't, you can't see their manipulation so well and you can't actually also see the effects of their manipulations that well. You can't clearly tell in an intuitive manner when they're recording and when they're not, when they're attending to you and when they're not. I mean, there are subtle cues and those have been explained. Um, and you know, when you interact with it, you can see little cues, but it, it's pretty subtle. So what you end up with is, is this sort of secretive interaction from a spectator point of view. Um, and you couple that with the fact that most people didn't have the device and hadn't actually interacted with the device the inherent nature of having a subtle wearable like this uh, with subtle signaling and subtle activities happening for the person who's engaging it leads to confusion and a feeling of kind of, oh, what is that person doing secretively with that device? Whereas if you think of something like a mobile, it's much more clear when somebody's manipulating the mobile what's happening when they're recording, why they're recording. You can kind of look over their shoulder and see what they're doing as well. Um, So that's, that's like, the question is, can you pick that up before you release the device, okay? Can you actually prepare for that? And I think this is a major issue in doing any kind of wearable uh, development uh, because if something's on someone's body all the time and they're moving around in the world using it, there will be social effects. You cannot design without thinking about social effects. I think that the most common tools for preparing for social effects are storyboarding and doing internal sort of vision videos and, and prototyping and testing things in house. Um, and storyboarding and videos uh, lead us to create these sort of best case use scenarios and they're great for, for um, selling up in an organization the potential of an idea and where it could go and also helping a development team think about what sorts of things they should build into the device in terms of features. But the thing that they lack that's really, really important is a resistance, a social resistance. A, a, it, if you're existing mostly on storyboarding and on internal testing and prototyping, and then you're bringing people in occasionally to play with the things you've mocked up, you can be really subject to a sort of um, emperor's new clothes phenomenon where everybody you're bringing in is doing the same kind of thinking about what's happening and is getting enculturated into what the device is supposed to do. And uh, you can miss really important things that would turn up in a more heterogeneous social environment. Yes? Just to push back on this a little bit. Social, we often react to these social impositions by creating new social norms. Absolutely. So it, may, it need not have been that the glasses outcome is just like, rejection, right? like yes. antibody, ugh, yes. get, get yes. this out. Yes. It might have been that we as a community like develop new norms about how we, for example, yes. make an honest signal of the tension, right? Because yes. if I no longer can because like yeah. I'm talking to James and he's got, he's wearing his he's wearing wireless, his, yeah. uh, you know, rainbows and uh, yeah. his contacts, right? Yeah. Um, there's some other way that he would compensate to say, and now mm -hmm. I'm really paying attention to you. Yeah. So I, I guess I worry that if all we say is that there's going to be social effects and you're not going to see them and they're going to be bad. Yeah. Like maybe we need to figure out how to really understand: is it going to be a game? Like, is it going to be just done? Yes. Killing it, yeah, or yeah. is it something that we can overcome? No, I totally agree with that. And actually, the the direction of my talk is offering a strategy for, in a sense, developing those antibodies. So instead of having to release something out, I mean, I think the major tactic these days is, you know prototype and do upsell and create a vision and then rush and get something onto the market and then see how it does and then people adapt to it and then your product also adapts. Mm -hmm. But I think there are strategies pre-release that can be used that come out of the world of, of gaming and game design that can be very effective. So that's exactly the direction the stock is going, so that's good. Um, okay, so I wanna do a slight detour before I go into why resistance matters and do a little old experiment. Um, so I'm, so, so, so I'm curious, which of these lines over here do you think is closest to the length of this line? And so, Michael, what do you think? Hey. <laughs> 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 C. 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 Okay. 
But did you guys have even a moment of like, you laughed, but did you have even a moment of kind of like, what? Why would he say that? How could he say that? Why is he saying that? Yeah. So imagine if it had been James plus five other, five, uh, Michael and James and, and five other people in the room saying, it's actually, it's actually A. How would you have felt then, right? No, they, well, well, what happened was they were, okay, so yes. So, so this, is, this is famous old research on a phenomenon called social conformity um, by Solomon Ash. And, and what he did was a much more extreme version of this. So he would have, you know, say five or six people in a room. Everybody but one person would be a confederate. They would be in on this thing. And they would go through multiple trials of this, okay? And after each trial, um, the people who are the confederates <laughs> Would, in, would all converge on the wrong solution together. And he would do it in this way where he would call out each person, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, getting to the person who was the true participant last. So how many times do you think people would actually change their answers in that kind of a social situation? Anybody have a guess at percentages? 50%. Worse. 90%. No, not quite that 70. bad. 75% of the time. People would change at least one of their answers in response to this. And that's just all to say that we are very, very uh, susceptible to one another's judgments and opinions in very subtle, subconscious ways. And I'm not actually pointing that out as a bad thing, because I actually think it's a good thing about human beings. It allows us to do things like adapt and quickly pick up behaviors to adjust to our environment. What it means for doing prototyping of devices is that you could really easily end up with a horrible, uh, clever Hans kind of effect in releasing a prototype to a controlled and contained group of people um, who will sort of adjust to your expectations about what that device should do and make their own judgments about it and decide it's cool in a certain way. Then when you put it out in the wild, you can be completely confused by the reception that you get. And I, I think that's the kind of thing that happened in the Google Glass context. So basically, my argument is, as technology moves into these more diverse social use contexts and it runs into these social norms and processes that are already going on, we need to actually design a social experience around the technology that adapts to and travels well with what's going on in the world. And we really need to spend some time understanding the social fabric around the use of the device and even cultivating and shaping that social fabric. So I think, you know, based on the work we've been doing in my lab, that we can use social play as a way to prototype and test and even shape the social fabric around wearables. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of projects that my group has built that have allowed us to explore ways we can drop a wearable tech intervention into a social setting and go for some novel and desirable social effects. And along the way, we learned some really valuable insights and practices from the indie game developers that we were working with. So this talk is about the strategy um, and the projects both. Um, so this photo of, is of a game called Yamuf, which I'll be talking about. But before I dive into some of the examples, I wanted to actually, you know, take a moment to justify why move toward play. So what does play have to do with these other situations? Well, I think of play as a way to craft a social situation with lower stakes. It's sort of a place apart. And um, it's a, a magic circle, if you will. This is a term that Huizinga and Salen and Zimmerman use. It's a context in which people will try on novel identities and novel interactions in a social group where they'll let go of and loosen some of their expectations about how they're supposed to behave and why and with whom, and step into reconfigurations that you can provide to them. So it's a chance to actually um, test out something that if it were not given to people in the context of play or a game, they would feel self-conscious or weird or uncomfortable doing. The other thing about play that's really valuable is there's an inherent culture around play of questioning and challenging and resisting and experimentation. So we're used to, from childhood, you know, taking a game, taking it in ourselves, modifying it the way we want, creating house rules, and having, a, having a, a, opinions about how the game should be played and how we could make it better. So play also provides a really natural context for trying to keep people in the situation where they're willing to give you robust feedback. Yes, you have a question over here. So you were talking about like, uh, just rolling experiments. And like how like you know you you get like a solid group of conformity and you get like distortions of perception around that. But mm -hmm. like didn't Puzinga also talk about like how like 
the magic circle is a magic circle because like it creates ritual and he has like this whole chapter in Honolulu is about like you know how ritual and like that sort of like religious conformity mm -hmm. um, is just a solidified crystallized version of play. So like mm -hmm. could you also say that play is also the like source of, you know, like super conformity, like ritualized <coughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, I see your point, but I think it depends on the context of play and, and the sort of the opt-in nature of play, right? When you get into ritual in society, rituals are sort of, in some sense, mandatory practices in a society. So those are maybe the two faces of gaming. But yeah, I agree with that. And it is a powerful force. And that's actually part of why I use it in my own work in HCI, because in crafting game-based experiences, people are much more willing to do a kind of wacky, crazy, say, movement-based interaction that they wouldn't take on in the same genuine way um, when testing it out as, as a, as a work-based situation, for example. So, so the ritual of gaming and the practices of gaming can allow you to make a different kind of intervention. So, so this picture is actually my daughter at the goodbye party for us when we came out here for sabbatical. And um, that's a hula hoop there. And what they decided, we had a hula hoop at the party, and they decided it would be really fun to all get in the hula hoop and run around together until they all fell down, <laughs> which, is an, which is something that you wouldn't necessarily think of if you crafted a hula hoop for, for use, right? It's a totally unanticipated thing, and, but it turns out to be super fun. So that's just a show. Uh, the culture of gaming and play being super flexible. OK, so first I'm going to share the story of a game that we made called Yamove. And this game actually migrated from being a mobile game to being a wearable style experience. And it was based on an extensive amount of social play testing in a wide range of venues that provided social resistance to our design. And I want to make a brief note to say that this game had a little bit of support from Yahoo, which is part of how it migrated into being called Yamove, which is kind of a funny side story. <laughs> so. Um, so with this project, we were interested in the transformative power of movement on emotional and social connection. And we wanted to build a game that would purposely bring people into the kind of synchrony and connection that happens when you're dancing together and having a really good time, as opposed to when you're dancing awkwardly and feeling really bad about how you're dancing and really hate being there. Um, so specifically, we wanted to explore the benefits of encouraging coordinated movement uh, because research shows its social benefits. And there's some really cool research about how Coordinated synchronous movement causes all these interesting things to happen for people. So we were actually working from a mobile game prototype that we had seen at this conference that was built by these guys from Carnegie Mellon. And that one was called Move It. And um, the core of the interaction in that game, and I'll show it to you in a minute, was um, tracking through the accelerometer synchrony in the motion between the two devices. And the way they had set up the interaction was, they would give the, it, so each of us would have the app. And one of us would say, I want to play the game. And then whoever was around could elect to play with. So it was a two-person game. And then you'd get a little cue card, like Make It Rain or Disco Inferno. And then the two of you had to quickly brainstorm what movement you were going to do that would map to that description. And then you'd get a countdown. And you'd have a certain amount of time to actually play the game. And then you could get put on this leaderboard. So the first thing we did, we're like, OK, well, we like this experience, but we want to really see what are the social implications of doing this? Is this, is this going to fly as a gaming experience? So we took it to this venue, which was called iBeam Co-op. And this, this is a, a public playtesting environment in New York City that happened once a month between this arts gallery and this festival that is called Come Out and Play. And anybody who wants to can bring a game there to, to test it. And the people who show up are a mix of everyday people and um, expert, actual expert game designers who are testing their games. So you get really great, really great feedback. Like turn the sound a little lower. So we just captured some of the uh, little movement cycles that people do. It didn't really matter at this stage if it was fast or slow movement. It was just were you in sync and how well were you in sync. So people were just trying all kinds of I think, there's, I think these guys actually end up hugging it out, too, at one point. But anyway, so, so while you're watching, just a couple of points to make. So, so what we took away from the playtest was basically 
people like doing crazy motions with each other, and they're funny to watch, but the app itself had some issues, one of which was that because of the nature of the mobile phone, you would fixate on the screen, do a little movement, and then fixate back on the screen. So whatever social momentum you had got with your partner was kind of diffused right away. And the other thing is that it looks kind of weird. It's kind of dorky to do it. It's kind of bizarre. So I mean, this was, this was a group of game designers who were really comfortable moving in weird ways. But from a spectacle point of view, this thing didn't work so well. It wasn't the kind of thing you would do, say, at a bus stop with a friend. Oh, yeah, there's a hug. <laughs> anyway. So um, we actually, um, <laughs> all right, I better, I better change the screen. You guys are going to win. So, so shortly after this, we were actually invited to this really interesting meetup to happen at this place called Baby Castles. And Baby Castles was this arts collective around games and alternative game design practice. And they were doing this event. Oh my gosh, I'm just full of obscenities today. This event called Fuck the Screen. Um, which was basically about, you know, how can we get away from people staring at screens when they play games? And so the, the organizer said, you guys are perfect for this. Come and test your game here. You're going to learn a lot from, from people who are playing the game here. So one thing we noticed right away when we got to this venue was that even though the title of this thing was all anti-screen, almost all of the games at the event had big screens. But they weren't using the screen for everyone to stare at. They were using the screen to heighten certain things about the game to pull spectators into the mix. And sure enough, when we had our game played um, in this venue, it was really hard for us to attract players because no one could really tell what was going on because they couldn't see what was going on. There was no larger than life projection about it. And they felt a little goofy and weird doing it. So we, so we got a combination of really helpful feedback and also just deep observational information from being in this, in this alternate setting. So um, one of the, one of the co-founders of Baby Castles actually sat down with us. And he said, hey, I'll, I'll work with you guys on this. I have some ideas for what you could do. He said, I think you should wrap this, this co-op uh, movement thing in a larger frame of competition, you know, kind of like b-boy, b-girl dance battle style stuff. So I'm just going to show you, for, for those of you who've never seen one of those, keep the sound low. He was like, you know, b-boy, b-girl dance battles, what happens is there's like a circle, there's a crowd around, the, and then there's dancers in the center, and they take turns, and it's very performative. And so what you could do is you could have, you know, you could have the people who are doing the team interaction now be a team against another team. So it could be, you know, like a three-round dance battle kind of thing. And we got really excited about that, because like, okay, all of a sudden, that gives us a really good normative social frame for this situation. It's like everybody knows about dancing. People understand that. People understand, uh, in a sense, how to judge dance moves and can kind of have opinions about what's going on. It doesn't feel weird or uncomfortable. Um, yeah. So we embarked on the process of designing a dance battle game. <clears throat> and this led to an intense series of changes in, in the whole structure of the interaction. And one of the most interesting things that happened is we stripped almost all of the interaction away from the mobile phone. And we ended up actually buying um, holsters, kind of like the ones you jog with. And we, we, we made our own um, sweatbands. Like we got embroidered sweatbands with the word yeah, move on them. I wish I still had some because I would have brought them here. But um, so we would, we, would, we would put the holster over that sweatband. And then we, we had a two-on-two -two battle. And so now, how do people know how they were doing? Um, they had a very simple you know, star score at the end that they could look at on the screen. Um, and then we also um, created a, a big screen projection that gave a little bit of detail about how people were doing as they were playing. But that wasn't for the players. That was actually for the spectators only. And we introduced an MC, just like in Dance Battles. So we had an MC who was actually calling out the feedback from the screen, <laughs> saying, shake it up a little bit, move it up, bust a new move, et cetera, et cetera. Because we realized, why reinvent the wheel? The audio feedback is the absolute best way to let people know how they're doing when they're dancing. Um, so I'm trying to think, did I cover everything that we changed? Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess the last thing, and I'll show you some interactions in a minute, is that we changed it to this three-round battle, which had the effect of creating this tension over time, this excitement about performance. And you know, like one team would win round one, and then maybe the other team would win round two. So it created this really familiar, understandable form of interaction around this, this novel movement dynamic. So I'll show you people playing. So, so Yamu, 
it turned out really well. It was actually a finalist at IndieCade, which is the big um, indie game venue for showing off one's work. Um, and it was also shown at several other exhibitions. Um, this is a video from IndieCade. And you know, I think what you can really see in this video is how engaged people got with each other in coming up with kooky, crazy moves. And also that it was engaging for the crowd. Um, and an interesting artifact of designing around movement synchrony was that you didn't have to copy moves on the screen for, like you would for a game like Dance Central and sort of copy what the machine did. You and your partner would, would figure out together what was gonna kind of show off your strengths and, and make you look the best. Um, so I had people with really, really different skill levels competing against each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't feel um, disjointed and they were actually able to have a reasonable competition. Like there's, there's one pair that's actually a, a, a little girl in, still in her soccer uniform and her mom who were competing and you know, everybody felt fine to just join, jump in and, and jointly improvise something. And Indicate, there they are. And Indicate is set up out in the streets in LA, in Culver City. So it's just a chaotic random mix of who wanders through and who's willing to play. And we felt comfortable going to that venue and we knew that our game was gonna work and be a success only because we'd been through extensive tuning. So after Baby Castles, we actually went back to the iBeam Co-op venue and we went to Parsons monthly game test and we tested our game every week in our own lab group and we had a pretty good sense by then that it was a robust intervention in a social situation. You know, that we weren't just thinking about individuals and how their devices were gonna work or I'm gonna meet you and we're gonna do this strange interaction Action. It was the whole context now which was being considered. And so when we dropped it into new settings, we had a lot more confidence that we were going to pull something, pull, be able to pull something off. Okay, so that's Yeah Move. The, the second game I want to share is still a work in progress. Um, and in fact, we just showed this. Did anybody see this at TEI on campus? Okay, like one person. Yeah, a couple <laughs> people. So um, this is a collaboration with my lab's artist in residence, whose name is Kahu Abe, and that's actually her right there. And um, she is pretty much the driver of the aesthetic choices in this game, and she has a really robust practice. She has an MFA in fashion, actually, but she spent the last, I don't know, five to 10 years building interactive physical social games that often involve a wearable component. Um, and she and I were brought together by this organization called iBeam, uh, which is an arts and technology uh, gallery in New York City. And they had an initiative with funding from the city, the Rockefeller Cultural Innovation Fund, around computational fashion. So how do you bring fashion and computation together? And how do you think about the intersection there? Um, so, so this game is actually aimed at exploring um, game, uh, wearables and costumes as game controllers. It's called the Hotaru Lightning Bug Game, and that's Kaho's name for it. And, and that is, is based on this, um, this myth of fireflies, and uh, I, don't, I don't know the backstory there. But she was building upon other mythologies from Japanese culture, and in particular, she was really inspired by this um, common writers. I don't know how many people are familiar with this TV show. OK, OK. So, so what, what Kaho finds so fascinating about this is this combination of the superhero costume, putting on the superhero costume and being transformed with gesture. Like with the common writers, it's not enough to just put the costume on, you have to strike the right pose. And so she was really interested in, well, could I change that into a game mechanic? And in particular, could I change that into a game mechanic that's collaborative between people? So it's not just some brave warrior on his own, it's actually poses that have to be done between two people. So, so this project is all about not just costumes as game controllers, but also costuming and wearable elements as a way to transform social interactions, okay? So she actually set out to create her own wearable costuming elements. And she was working from this story of the lightning bugs. Basically, her, her vision as she describes it is um, these tiny lightning bugs battling back to back and fighting these tremendous forces and somehow making people feel that sense of collaboration and smallness and coordination and collaboration. Um, so these are some initial sketches she made of one of the wearable components of the game. And then she went on to build this wearable gauntlet and backpack. It's like two, two costuming elements. 
Um, so you see the gauntlet is here, and then this is, this is the light up portion of the backpack. And both of them are actually driven by mobile phones, which is kind of interesting. So she, she built space inside for this Android mobile phone, and then she's using an IOIO OTG board to drive the, the lights flashing and the sounds and the interactive component of the experience. So the game interaction basically goes like this. Um, if you were playing with me, then each of us would choose which, which costuming component we were going to wear. And one of us would be the energy harvester, and the other one would be the person who was actually sending the energy out to fight the evil forces in the world. Okay? And both of us would have um, gloves on our hands. And so, um, so the person who's gathering energy, who's wearing the backpack, they have to do these gestures like this. And as they move, um, the lights on their backpack slowly go up, so they've reached um, a maximum energy. And when they get to that point, and their partner kind of has to tell them because they can't see on their back, they join hands with the partner. And then the second person who's wearing the gauntlet then waits for the gauntlet to charge up, and they can see this by watching the lights. And then there's a sound, so you know that the energy has been released from the gauntlet. And so you try to go through this pair interaction which basically involves hand holding, sometimes with a stranger, as many times as you can to clear the atmosphere um, of clouds. So I'll show you a little video of the gameplay. So this is a TEI. So we, so we recorded everybody. We, we had play the game. And we just tossed it all on a tumbler, told people we were tossing it on a tumbler. So if you guys want to go and see these interactions, you can later. Um, but you can see here. Here's the guy you know, gathering the energy, and then he holds hands yep, to really make contact, and then the gauntlet charges up, and then okay. And you can't see it in this frame, but there's, there's a, a sky projected on the wall, and over time, the clouds start to leave the sky, so you're basically releasing energy to disperse these clouds. So you can see. Well, you can see a lot of things in these videos. One thing you can see is, is it's, it's kind of goofy and fun. It's also a little bit confusing. And um, one of the things we're really interested in looking for is um, how people's relationships transform as they go through this experience. Is it a bonding experience for them or not? And how does the costuming transform how they feel about who they are that may or may not allow them to actually you know, bond over this experience? Um, so this game similar to Yamuv, went through an extended, extended semi-public and public prototyping experience. So when we first, when we first got the first rendition going for iBeam after the initial collaboration was finished, Kaho had built this huge projection dome. And it was, she had sewn it herself out of, of uh, material that, project, that uh, like projection material she'd gotten from somebody else. And, and you were meant to do the interaction inside this, this overarching screen. And she had built this laser into the gauntlet that you could aim inside the dome. And so you could actually aim it at targets inside the dome. And she had this very complex mirror working with the projection that tracked the laser and so forth, um, which was kind of cool in its own way. It was quite a technological achievement. But it turned out that it got people way too focused on the screen. It sort of took her right back to the same issues we were having with Yamu, which is everybody was just, it was like, it was like looking at a bunch of moths fluttering around a light bulb, right? Nobody was really paying attention to the gestural nature of the interaction. They were all paying attention to what was going on on the screen. Um, and then other little, little things she tried, she, um, she initially had this idea of goggles. So she thought the person with the backpack wouldn't be able to see their energy collection and would need help from the aimer. Uh, for that, and that the person who had the gauntlet would then need help from the energy collector to actually aim. So she was obfuscating their vision with these goggles and totally didn't work. Really, really bad idea. So these iterations all took place over multiple tests. And I would argue that we couldn't really have come up with the radical reinventions that we did internally to our lab group. There would have instead been a focus on continuing to refine the technological path we were going down for way too long. But going out into these social settings like gallery spaces and independent gaming venues gave us some really honest feedback and sometimes hard to take feedback about which portions of the technological construct we'd put together were working pe for people and which were not. And one thing that's really great about working with indie game developers is they will just drop things that don't work. 
you know, and they'll take a project back to the beginning and, and rethink their core assumptions. And what they're really after is the end experience for people who are playing. So they're not necessarily like some of us, and I've fallen into this trap myself in technology research, you can kind of get yourself wedded to a particular technology or a set of constellation of technologies and not be willing to drop some of what's going on in the interest of the end experience for people. So at present, you know, if we look back at, well, actually, let's, let's take a step forward. At present, she's building more and more um, signaling into the devices themselves. So she got rid of the dome as painful as it was. She, I mean, she didn't like throw it away. She's going to use it for other things. But she's really focusing on building signaling through the lighting and through the sound effects and things into the costumes themselves um, to put the attention of the crowd and the attention of the players very much more onto one another and onto the transformative experience they're going through. Um, and what we've been doing since we started this at TEI, we're going to do this at other festivals over the course of this year, is we started this Tumblr and we're taking pictures of people before and after, kind of like you know when you go into a photo booth, like before and after, like little film strips of play to see um, do people's positioning change? Does their physical relationship to each other change after they've had the experience? And does the presence of the costumes change what they think to do when they're being photographed? Um, and we're doing interviews and, and recording videos of their interaction and trying to understand what does an intervention like this do for people? How does it affect their connection to each other? So, so how many people think these folks knew each other? Do they look like they knew each other? They kind yeah, of do, yeah. right? Yeah. Did not know each other at all. And, and, and the photos are funny. You can go and look. A lot of times, people will be smiling and standing next to each other a little awkwardly, maybe a little space between them. And after they play, they're doing these crazy poses, right? Because they've just been trained doing these poses. But they have a choice about what they do when they're asked to take a snapshot at the end and what they're choosing to do, sort of validating some of what we're after. Um, so I guess I would say for this game, what happened was a kind of clarifying and purifying process of back to the core aesthetic that Kaho had in the beginning that kind of drifted during the project. So she started to, to layer more and more technology onto this experience in a way that ended up distracting from it. But taking it out into these social venues and having people try it out and give us really honest feedback about it led us to go back and pare down what affordances, what kinds of feedback, and how the interaction should take place. So I think this is one really interesting thing about game testing culture in the indie community is that there are these venues and these forums for getting robust feedback before you have something fully released. And an interesting side note on that is that actually ends up helping people build an audience or a following for their game. So you would think, well, maybe that would be bad because uh, it would lead to people copying a game. But in fact, that's not usually what happens. What happens is it slowly builds understanding and you know as you were saying that plasticity and adaptability in a community so what's happening is a sort of antibody effect where you, know, you test a game you workshop it with people who are experts like yourself they give you feedback and they get familiar with it then they go off and they talk about this cool game they saw and this interesting interaction and then the next time you're testing it somewhere there are a few people who are curious about it who kind of wanted to see what it was and then they have a say and then the thing gets modified further so by the time it actually gets to a place like indicate or you know, some, some other gallery setting, there is a ready-made audience who's interested and curious about where the thing went and sort of bought into and entrained with how it functions. So that gets me to wanting to link this back to designing social wearables in general. So you might be saying to yourself, well, OK, those are interesting projects. But how does that actually translate outside the realm of gaming? Isn't gaming a sort of specialized context? And as I said at the beginning, I would argue that, yes, we are setting up explicit gaming situations here. But what we're also doing is just setting a frame for social interaction. And I think there's a lot more leeway in designing uh, situations for wearable use, something like glass or something like the <laughs> Fitbit, where you tell everybody who's participating in testing something, you're doing this. Let's say you're doing this. Act as if you're doing this. You, you provide them with a play scenario that has some distance from their everyday life and that has some objectives to it and has a sense of playfulness to it. I think you can get the same sorts of results in that kind of context. And I think the reason this is important is that 
you need the actual resistance of seeing people actually behave in a genuine social manner in order to pick up these complex secondary effects around these sorts of technologies. So you have to figure out a way that you can get a group of people, not just the people interacting, but potentially also people who are going to be spectating something like this, to play act it in such a way that they feel the genuine feelings that are going to come up for them when they're using the thing in a real situation. And so I think the combination of thinking carefully about social scenarios that maybe don't ask somebody to be exactly themselves, but put them in a playful context where they're trying out some social situation around the wearable, combined with thinking about venues that provide resistance, communities that provide their own set of critical standards that you can bring a, a prototype into and get some genuine feedback are, are the two things that I think are the most relevant about the work that we've been doing. Um, So thinking about wearables, I think it's interesting that one of the most successful categories of wearables has been these fitness wearables. And as we were talking about at the beginning, you know, what, what happens is there's iteration as products are released. So you know, the first iteration, oh, it causes a rash. We have to change that, right? Um, one thing that's been interesting to me is, so I have, I have this Fitbit Flex. And it has almost no interface on it at all. It's just these little, little dots. And the Nabu is the same way. The Nabu has just a little screen. Um, on the inside of the wrist. And so there's been this movement as the devices have come out, like typically before you would see, oh, maybe something will get laden with more and more features as it comes out and you know, people pile on features and that's the direction to go. But in fact, what's happened is more and more subtle signaling from the device that blends more and more gracefully into people's everyday social interaction as those devices have dropped into these communities of practice. And I think probably that wearable community got a boost from being uh, from beginning in this area of um, sports aficionados who like to share, share their fitness progress anyway with one another. Um, so there was a ready-made, robust, critical community that these kinds of wearables could drop into and learn from. Um, so I, I guess that's another lesson I would say to take from this if you're working in this domain, is if you're trying to envision uh, a, a, a use for social wearables that, if, if that you should look for a community of practice that you can feed off of and drop your intervention into that will give you resistance to your own ideas of what it may or may not be through engaging with it over time. So picking a motivated community that would actually engage your prototypes is a way to avoid having to just test this in the wild by fully re releasing products. Um, and I want to close by showing you a funny video that's an example of that from the Yamuv project. So, you know, since we were in New York, we could actually work with real b-boys and b-girls. And I mean, this stuff got started way back in the 80s, but it's still going on. I mean, there's this, there's this dance battle that goes on every year called Chicken and Biscuits or something like this in New York. And, we, and one of the people in the lab actually knew one of the organizers of Chicken and Biscuits. So she brought people from who were going to compete in that competition into the lab to try out the game. And uh, they did some really crazy things. So we hadn't really thought about this, but they do a lot of floor work and that kind of dancing. And so at one point, these guys just started jumping around on the floor and doing moves and um, getting really pretty crazy. And so right after this, the next thing they did was they had us get some duct tape. And they tried out uh, taping the mobiles to their ankles <laughs> to see if they could get better scores. <laughs> From, from the game, uh, which they couldn't. And they were like, oh, the algorithm is all messed up. That really sucks. But it, w it was the kind of thing that you could never, ever, I would have never anticipated that that would happen. And it happened. And, and it happened in the lab instead of happening out in the wild. So that's just an argument for um, engaging with communities of practice and finding resistance from people. Um, and interestingly enough, these guys actually helped us uh, demo Yamuv at the World Science Festival later. So we ended up having an enduring relationship with them. So they weren't just play testers. They became a part of the lab community in their own way. So, so what I would say to you is if you're getting into this area to consider being playful and also seeking resistance. And that is all I have to say. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, reactions, dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> dance moves. John has a dance move. <laughs> uh, so I'm really intrigued by your choice of including a human in the Yamu. Mm -hmm. uh, because sort of building on Michael's questions, it sort of 
adds to that social conformity. It actually gives you a confederate, right, to help yeah. them. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could just reflect a little bit about yeah. the role of that human, and that's kind yes. of the interesting difference between that and the lightning bug game, where yeah. they, the, the actors themselves, have to make sense of this game without this kind of problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that moved around during the course of development. So. So the education is actually happening by the program itself. It's, yeah. it's measuring, and it's, it's how fast you move, how in sync, and do you make diverse moves. Yeah. Um, but the MC calls out to the players how they're doing um, based on what's going on on the screen. Um, so during the course of development, we also toyed with the idea of having human judges as well. Um, and we tried that interaction out. And what we realized, and this is actually a pretty interesting truth about how computers intersect with social reality, is that judging is so socially complex, people were really happy to hand that off to the computer, that the computer could kind of be the referee. And then you could, you could rag on it how unfair it was and kind of have this fun interaction with the dumb technology instead of having an awkward social encounter. And, and judging, it causes a lot of controversy in the dance battle world, like who's judging, what are the criteria, and so on and so forth. So the MC actually, their role is really more to create a party atmosphere. So the MC in our case was a real MC who mixed music in addition to kind of calling out and like, you know, saying funny, silly things in addition to giving people feedback from the screen. So that's, that's optimal because the MC is much better than a computer at sensing when the mood is lagging or when something bad is going on. You see what I mean? So, so, so there definitely were some moves we made in creating an elastic system that allowed the computer to do the thing it could do well, like sort of educating the sensing it was doing, and then using humans to sort of amplify the mood stuff. So, so we did one play test actually where we didn't have a strong MC. And oh, it was so funny. And there was a lot of guys there. Like it was kind of a guy heavy play test at IBM Co op. They started doing calisthenic wars. They started doing like intense jumping down. And they were so exhausted, they couldn't actually finish playing. <laughs> like it was no fun for them at all. And we're like, whoa, how, what went wrong? What the hell? You know? And we realized, well, actually, the music as a frame and the MC kind of bounds the possibility space for people, what they think is an acceptable move to make, right? And then kind of micro adjust the mood, you know? Like, like the MC could say jokey things about people who are getting too into it or kind of pump up people who are nervous, you know, by making just the right comments. So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So the, the MC, in, in terms of the, the comments that he was actually making to the, the players on how <laughs> How kind of strongly or weakly were they guided by the actual um, the actual presentation of the information that they were making in the stuff? I'm, I'm trying to gauge basically kind of how different would the, the scenario have been if you tried to like Im implement text to speech on the phones yeah. themselves. Well, I mean, the part where he was so 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 the interface. I don't know if you noticed during the video, but. There were basically star, a star system for each of the three variables. And then there would be like text that would say, you know, mix it up or pick up the pace or whatever. So, so, so that stuff was going on on screen. The issue is when you're dancing and you're trying to copy each other's moves, you're not going to look at it. But a text-to-speech could certainly have said those sorts of things. But in addition, he was also saying things to kind of reassure and calm people, which would involve a lot of other sensing that we didn't have built into the game, right? Like noticing when someone looks like they're feeling awkward or when somebody's clearly, you know, uh, getting out of step with their partner and making their partner crazy, like all kinds of little nuanced social dynamics that it would be quite challenging to track. So, yeah. Yes? I want to come back to some of this conformity question. So yeah. I feel like there's a competing narratives within this mm. presentation. So, you, you talked about the Ash conformity experiments and mm -hmm. how this can sort of, uh, in the case of, say, glass, lead to a bit of a rejection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you also mentioned that you're socializing people into liking the game more and, ex yes. and expecting, yes. like, oh, I've heard there's this yes. interesting thing and I come to experience And any, yeah. anyway, anyone who, like, ever owned a pet rock or played mm -hmm. Paws mm -hmm. or, um, sorry, I'm... I'm blanking. What's the 2000s equivalent of this? Uh, something that's not actually fun, but everyone decides which one. Um, the I think there's actually legitimacy there. Like 
Pogs, okay, maybe not the best yeah. game in the yeah. world, yeah. but like we're all having fun because we've decided we're going to have fun. Yes. So, Yo. That, so, so, sorry. Yo. Yo. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, cutting a little close to home there. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, but so there's this. Uh, there's the positive side where like social influence is actually getting us to feel okay dancing, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it's not clear to me how we prototype that. Yeah. Because like, well, that seems to be the core of this. Is like, well, how, is it going to? <laughs> but I think we can. Like, I guess you know. People who create indie games, who, people who are part of scenes, they are actually crafting the social fabric at the same time that they are crafting their intervention in the social fabric. And they're testing their ideas and how the social body will respond to it. And that's an integral part of their design process. So I think you can use it for good or evil. I think you, you know, and, but people are not dumb. Like you might have gotten a pet rock and you were happy with it for, you know, 10 minutes and then it just, sort of sat there and at some level in your life you kind of reflect if you're not like the ultimate consumer on, I don't think I'm gonna buy another thing like that pet rock. That was another thing. You know, but maybe it was super fun to do the Gangnam style dance for a while, even though it was ridiculous because so many people were doing it. So it's a fickle thing, the social fabric, and it changes over time. And I guess I guess my question is can it be designed? Yeah, I think it can be designed. I th I, I think you can well I think you can see patterns in how people use the social fabric, and you can artfully and intentionally put them into your design, and you can also release your design into the world in a way that makes use of the social fabric. I don't think you can predict, I guess, I, I don't think you can create a major new change in it intentionally. I guess I'm more saying you can work with it as a material mm -hmm. and, and shape that along with the context of what you're doing. Yeah. You're not trying to create something viral, you're just trying to create something that is, feels like it's in, at home in the sort of context. Of yeah, that feels at home and that is a trial balloon of, of the kind of thing you want to do, where mm -hmm. you've tested it out and seen how people respond, so you have a sense of whether it might go viral. I mean, I don't think you can have an idea and know, and certainly that's, that's a lovely a goal. No, no, he had absolutely, he'd done tons of songs exactly like that, yeah. Yeah, but I think you ignore that phenomenon at your peril, right? Like, I think you can, you can avoid falling flat on your face. Like, if you've decided you're doing wearable tech, A, you have to realize it is inherently social because it's on your body and it's performative whether you like it or not. And it's not enough to just craft scenarios, like small scenarios, and then do a bunch of internal testing you have to actually check it out against the social fabric, and that's, that's an iterative and um, back and forth process, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then the benefit of that is by the time the thing goes out in the world, it's also much more likely to be readily adopted because you've kind of flushed out things that you wouldn't have otherwise caught. It's like a closed beta. Yeah, it's like a closed beta, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I was wondering if this kind of idea of having fun can be applied more generally. Like, not when fun is the intent of the application or whatever, but um, if this idea of making people comfortable makes them judge things more realistically mm -hmm. and you know interact with them in a way that's that's a good test um, to develop further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the message I would take from this, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be play, but I think a lot of it has to do with um, how organic and real does the social situation feel to me? And, and am I in your territory where you have a social group I'm trying to drop into? And that's why I brought the conformity stuff in. It's like you may think you have a relatively robust you know, prototype and you're going to bring in a, a group of people to test your thing, but they're coming into your lab and then they see all these people as they walk in. And even though they have their own group, it feels small in relationship to this giant infrastructure that they're walking into. They don't feel on their own turf. Right? So I think a lot of it, too, is being thoughtful about the situations in which you test and trying to find communities of practice that feel confident and have their own sort of dominant group structure so they feel quite confident giving you feedback because it's no skin off their nose if your thing still isn't working. You know? And the beautiful thing about the indie game development community is people do that for one another and so are mutually vulnerable as they make their things. So you even get expert feedback on top of the community of practice, which is also super. You know, and that's a whole other question is how to cultivate that kind of community of practice around things like wearables. 
Do you have a question? I am curious about, um, with Yomu, you talked about how in some ways this was sort of inspired by research showing that um, gestural synchronicity creates emotional synchronicity. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about, or will you test that now that you yeah. have this great, graceful thing? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so it's a whole other challenge to design an experiment that tests that in a rigorous way with a game. Right. And um, actually, Jeremy Balenson has some really great work on synchrony and conversation. I think it's um, Andrea Wan. Is that? Yeah. So her work really pinpoints that question. So one of the things I've learned in engaging in building games is um, my work has kind of migrated to a more system building, HCI approach of research from a classical social science comparative experiment kind of research, because pinning down the variable rigorously enough to ask the question is almost impossible with the structure of some of these things, right? So another example is where we've been working with the woman who does the power posing research um, about how power posing makes you feel more powerful. And yeah, so we've been going round and round with her about like making something that still feels gamey, but that is, is, is confined enough to withstand social psychological testing uh, rigor, you know, and it, it's, it's an interesting challenge, yeah. Use like a computer, um, you can keep a design for a few years, number of years, and keep a pretty similar design. And if it's accepted, people enjoy it for a while. Yeah. When it comes to wearables, is yeah. it difficult to work with fashion designers when fashion is so temporary and fleeting? Things may change in a few months' time. So if you're designing something and shipping it later this year, how do you know? Or like, what are your concerns with keeping it? My current, I guess. Well, you know what? So I work with that computational fashion project, and what I learned is some things change about fashion and some do not. Okay? Zippers do not change. Velcro was a big change, but like handbags do not change. Glasses, you know, the certain form factor, the, the, the sort of human factors part of fashion changes very slowly. So, and then the furlifants on top of that, like the materials and the, you know, the heel goes up or goes down and that sort of thing, like those kinds of things change, 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 change. So I think a lot of the challenge at the intersection between wearables and fashion is figuring out, you know, it's like the cases on the mobile phones, right? Like there's a good example. You can just slap a new case on that phone and then you can have those two cycles, you know, happening in parallel. You know, so technology is funny because it actually changes much more than fashion in terms of the core human factors and affordances side of what's going on, but that's kind of expensive in and of itself, so nobody wants to add a, another layer to that process. So, I mean, that's a tremendous challenge in that world, actually. I don't, I don't have great answers for that one. Yeah. Uh, this is just sort of a simple question, but what wearable technology would you like to see in the world that doesn't mm -hmm. exist yet? Oh. I think I would like to see, so there's kind of a movement these days around recognizing that quality, physical co-presence, and mutual attention is a benefit. Uh, but it's pretty tricky to measure. There are people who are starting to be able to measure it. So Sandy Pentland is an example in MIT. Like He's got these badges that he uses to measure if people are talking to each other and who they're talking to to try to measure quality of mutually co-present attention. So I think it would be really cool if people made wearables that rewarded you for mutually co-present attention, for basically being socially present with others, right? Because I think almost all the technology is going the other direction, like, bing, oh my god, I have a text. And so we're all like fragmented and not actually present. So I think like finding, and this gets into the thing I was saying before about adjudication, like if there's subtle signals where you're rewarded with feedback that's emanating from you that shows how attentive you are, that could really change things, right? It could sort of tip the balance because we're all rewarded by answering. We get the partial reinforcement by answering our emails and our texts. And that is more important to us than the quality of attention we give to the person in front of us. So I would kind of like to gamify co-present attention in a subtle way with wearables. How's that? Or like your t-shirt, your t-shirt, your t-shirt gets colder. You get colder and colder the less attention you're paying to people. And you start to shiver and you're like, woo, woo, woo. And your t-shirt starts to take this blue hue and you're like, whoa, okay, I've got to, got to focus. You know, <laughs> that's the really kind of thing I'm talking about. Like more visceral, more, and, and also observable, yes. I think Kevin, I don't know if this is related, but uh, I wasn't really clear how the work's going to do. How, how, how do you see this work? Yeah. So interestingly, 
I, I do have people in my lab who are you know, migrating out of the world of games per se and into playful interaction around everyday experience. So things like using gesture to unlock a door or um, kinesthetic tools for fidgeting that can help modulate your mood. So, so one of the things I'm doing now is trying to take some of this thinking about the subtle social and emotional signals that are happening in these play spaces and see if I can move these into situations where you're not necessarily in a leisure context, but you do care about well-being and connection and how do we actually attend to those variables and, and measure them as well. So you talked about how in the indie game community there's this cool um, culture of people getting early feedback mm -hmm. and getting feedback from communities of people who are likely to resist. Yeah. And I'm interested in how this could be extended to products that aren't necessarily games. Yeah. So I wanted to ask if you were the like the lead product designer for Google Google Glass. Yeah. What sort of feedback or user testing would you have done to yeah. make sure yeah. it didn't fail? No, it's a really good question. So, so, so there's this game company, Harmonix. Have you guys all have heard of Rock Band, right? So Har Harmonix did really extensive internal testing, not just in the Rock Band group, but the whole company. And everybody had to form a band and play the game and give feedback. So they kind of like used this weird, oh, you're in the company, so you got to you know, eat the dog food, whatever. But they got much more robust and interesting feedback from, they, they used the fact that they were of a certain scale to you know, use their internal community to get some resistance and some actual interesting feedback. And so I think one thing that people can do, I mean, Google has a scale to it and has people sign these phenomenal confidentiality agreements, right? So there's no reason they couldn't use you know, much more robust heterogeneity within their organization you know, to, to craft scenarios where people are really testing the thing. And I, I bet they're doing that already more and more, probably partly as a result of like, oh my god, why, why do people think this about our wonderful tech? You know? I mean, because it is, you know, it's very hard to predict these things. I mean, you know, it's important, it's important to say that. It's important to say nobody's dumb who goes out and has this happen to them. It's just, it's, an it's a wicked problem to anticipate social interaction. Right, but that makes it so high stakes. So I think that's one strategy. I think another strategy, but just maybe less plausible, is finding ways for communities of developers to form movements and kind of artfully share things in ways that they're giving each other more genuine feedback as things go along. And I know that's hard because of competition, but I think it would benefit everyone. I guess that's partly the role of research. You know, so in some senses, iteration happens more and more in the product world. We lose that aspect of you know, hard looks at things before they're actually out there in the world. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Let's thank Catherine one more time.